All right, so everybody in here okay now? So we're going to go through basically the, uh, the nuts and bolts of, of delivering a lesson. In the certification process, we don't really go into real depth of how to execute a lesson. This is very specific to, you know, what, what you can be thinking and how you can schedule your lesson and how you can bill your lesson, everything. Uh, because you start to see how it will flow, especially for people like Stuart, who's really new to the organization and is thinking about next season and, you know, where I'm going to uh, kind of build my business and that sort of thing. Okay, so we're going to get started. Jeff, uh, Jeff and I are going to kind of go together and tag team this. You're going you're gonna to lead primarily, Jeff, today? Or do you want me to? No, uh, whatever you like, man. We can ham and egg it like we usually do. Okay. Well, then I'll. Uh, <laughs> I'll uh, really well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll start with uh, with a little bit of talk, and then so we're gonna we're gonna go through you know basically how a lesson uh, gets completed, and we're gonna look at the different aspects. So right off the bat, booking your lesson you need to know right away what level of golfer, you know, what, what are they coming, you know, with what kind of history, do they have any special needs requests? Do they have golf clubs? All these things are, again, this might be a little bit of a common sense review, but also is this just a one-off lesson? Or are they a part of a series? Really important that you find out how they found you as a business person you should, you should be interested in that data. You know, all the big companies, they're, they're wondering what, what leads are working for them and what they need to focus on. Are they in search of a specific correction? So, well, I can't hit my driver. I can't uh, chip. I can't pot. I slice everything. That, that's one of the things that you may want to ask when you're booking. And then you want to be very specific for their peace of mind and you don't want them all riled up by the time they get you. So you want to explain where you'll meet them, uh, when you'll meet them. And my, my example is I teach at Oak Hills. I get the question all the time, where do I meet? I'm on the driving range. Well, where's the driving range? And then, you know, explain where the driving range is and then explain, well, I'm the six foot four goofy looking guy out there, you know, that's, uh, you, you won't miss me kind of thing. And usually they don't, they, you know, I stand out on the driving range. You might have a specific place that you like to meet. You, you also might be like me where your lessons are back to back. Uh, so you don't have time to go out and find them in the parking lot. And I usually tell them uh, if, if I'm, if they're the first one of the day, I, I might say, well, I'll meet you right at the edge of the parking lot. And then we'll go over to the range. I will also say, well, I'm teaching a 10 year old kid on the range, uh, at 10 and you're at 11 or 10 30 or whatever it is. And, and put them at peace of mind that they know, Hey, he's already there and he's already teaching. So that's really important at the time of booking. Anything to add at that? Yeah, I think it makes it, uh, again, that you start that connection, that, that relationship right away. So with COVID, you know, we have a greeter on the driveway. They don't really need to know that person's name, but I like to go to the greeter before I get there and say, look, I've got lessons coming in. Uh, please direct them to the pro shop where they have to go inside and pay. So then my next trip is to the pro shop saying, look, here's, I got Sue at 10, I got Bill at 11, blah, blah, blah. I give them a list, the time, their name, the rate at which they're going to pay. And then can you please give them a small basket of balls and point them or direct them to the teaching area, which is well marked on the driving range. So just inform everybody, make, make sure that your student feels warm and welcome there's no questions about where they're going who they're looking for there's a designated teaching area uh, they get the small basket of balls again depending on their skill set are they going to warm up before that or are they just going to meet me there yeah so start off the the whole session uh right with being very cordial 
I guess would be the word I'm looking for. Right. And then again, if you're if you're using an online booking system, they have some some positives and negatives. So just be careful how that works for you. I like what Mark said. Keep finding out how they found you. So if you know your marketing is working and make sure that you give yourself enough time between lessons to meet and greet and end the last lesson. So don't fall into the trap of going back to back without giving yourself some time and space to complete the, the lesson and then set up for the next one. All right, All right. so now we've got the student to the, uh, to the ring and um, you're, you're all ready to, to, to get to work, so to speak but it's really the time to ease into things, uh, put the golfer at ease and turn, turn the table on them and find out from them what, what they really are there for and you know, establish what are the students' goals. Uh, do they have long-term goals, short-term goals? Are they, you know, do they have a time frame? Do they have time to commit to practice? Is it realistic? And that, that's a lot of information sometimes. And sometimes you'll find out right away that this is going to be hard next uh, few minutes. You know, you're going to work hard and uh, the person's expectations aren't always uh, a, real, a reality, right? Uh, what holds them back? You, you're going to find out a little bit of information about that do, do they have mobility issues do they have injuries do they have any sort of um, uh, body trouble that will uh, cause them uh, stress in in change that's one of the things that we're going to get to the next part but you're going to see a lot of people say oh no i'm i'm pretty good and then uh and then the reality sets in as soon as they start hitting balls but so yeah, take take a few minutes and kind of inter interview them, get them. What I like to do is talk to them a bit because I like talking and that puts them at ease so they're not right under the gun. Some people think that, well, I'm taking a golf lesson, I'm a good golfer and it's like the complete opposite, but they don't know that because they're, uh, they're, they're new or they're, uh, they've never taken a lesson before. Anything yes. Else? So make some notes, right? Jot some things down. It, again, it shows that you care, right? If you if you're going to start a little file on them, it doesn't have to be a whole journal per se. But you know, this might be again something that you keep in a binder uh, when Mrs. Smith comes for her first, second, third lessons. Some way of keeping track. Yeah, she's got a right hip replaced. She has zero time to practice. She works all day. She has 14 kids, you know. Um, so then you got to back it off and say, how, how realistic is this? Keep some notes so you can go back and say, oh, well, you told me you didn't have a hip replaced uh, two weeks ago or two lessons ago. Now, all of a sudden, you can't do that because, you know. I teach a lot of beginners and um, my first thing that I find out is they know nothing about their clubs. They know nothing about what they do or how they do it. And, uh, you know, I find, well, if you don't know anything about the clubs and you're going to take golf, I better teach you what those clubs do and what they're designed to do and how they're doing it and sort of help them to learn by uh, doing their own thing, by sort of quizzing them and saying, well, this one, what do you think? What do you see the difference in these two yeah. clubs? Yeah, exactly. It's so uh, it's so imperative. I found that one of my one of my uh, most useful skills. Valerie, you're ahead of us. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No problem. I'm sorry. But, no, you're no, you're right on the money. They're, you're absolutely right. The, the the people have so many different issues, and I didn't mean that in a bad way. You're just you're, you're, <laughs> so just, you're just Panasonic. Yeah. No, I was just thinking about, well, how do you go about teaching a lesson and what do you do first? So yeah. anyway, I'm, I'll, I'll keep my no. mouth shut now. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Back to Mrs. Yeah. Smith. Her best part of the week is the 60 minutes with Jeff. That's the way I see that. Eh? 14 Thank you. kids and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 
now oh, we, we've had our little our introduction and now we're going to lead into warm up this is the time we want to watch and listen and learn we're going to see what we're we're going to work on but <laughs> sometimes it's hard the students sometimes right out, out of the gate for established players hit the ball great because they're not thinking about anything. They're just trying to loosen up and hit the ball. And then the further into the lesson, they get tired out and working and stressed. And so the warm up can also be a little misleading, but for most students, you're gonna, you're gonna get some stretches. Make sure they're stretched out. And in red here, I've got uh, now the body limitations come out when you start stretching and or you start seeing them hit golf balls. Eh? There's like, well, I really do have a bad elbow or I have a bad shoulder. Or a bad... But five minutes ago, when we were asking you about it. There was nothing wrong with you, right? Yeah, the uh -huh. trick knee. Have the trick knee. <laughs> yeah. So um, the new golfers, you never want them to warm up by uh, hitting golf balls because that's what they're there to, to learn is how to hit a golf ball. So you're gonna say, well, I'll just go hit a few golf balls and I'm gonna watch you. It's like, no, 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 no. You're gonna give them a structure and, and we're, you know, that structure we cover in detail when you take the course. But, but yeah, if, if you got a new golfer, you're gonna just stretch them out, gonna talk to them, and then you're gonna get hitting balls in the next part. So the warm up again, five to 10 minute, little bit of time. Good, Jeff. Yep, yep. So again, you don't need to have to have them on the ground, uh, you know, doing various stretches or exercises. So uh, there's lots of great things that you can do to warm them up in a standing position and then work them through, you know, just a general shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, back, uh, neck, that sort of thing. So it doesn't have to be super technical. And just as I, I touch base on it, remember it's nice and rhythmical. There's when we warm up for sporting activities, there's no long hold and count to eight, nine, 10, right? It's very slow, very rhythmical, okay? Dynamic stretching as opposed to static stretching, just as a reminder. Okay. After warm up, um, we're going to get a little more serious and we're going to identify or determine the, the program, what we're going to work on today. And there might be 400 things that you see that you want to work on, but we're going to pick really one issue. And it shouldn't take that long to diagnose what that one issue is going to be. And of course, you're always going to start with the setup the grip, the stance, posture, ball position. You're going to look at that. This is where Valerie's equipment issues uh, would definitely uh, fit in. We've all had students come with eel of fitted uh, equipment or more importantly, the equipment that they think should do something and there's no chance it's going to do that. So the explanation that, you know, what you're trying to use that piece of equipment for in theory would be all right, but due to your skill set and the club head speed, it's not going to perform quite like you think. So once once you have identified the issue, whether it be the grip, the stance, the like a setup issue, a, a static position issue, or the equipment, tempo or timing, or if it's something a little more technical, then you know, you're going to spend a few minutes on that, watching them hit balls. Uh, again, we don't want to give them too much information. This isn't, uh, this isn't really the time where you're going to be like, okay, well, I see this, 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 and this, but we're going to work on this. Again, it's less information, pick something to work on and, and go from there. Yeah. So uh, I think it's in the next slide there, Mark, but how do, how do we, you know, identify what, what's going to determine what we're going to work on? What's, how are we going to get to that diagnosis, right? And here it is. Is it a swing fault? Are you watching your ball flight, right? Have you used a video? Would you use a video, right? What they may be telling you that they're doing, uh, what they feel versus real is sometimes uh, pretty off in, in their relationship. But 
you have to really, again, be able to identify what's the issue um, and what needs to be fixed first in order to help them achieve their, their goal, right? So um, sometimes they come, you know, having a, a certain um, fix that they're looking to get cured or figured out or fault, whatever we want to call it. Uh, sometimes the issue lies much bigger. And if it's in that swing sequence, then we have to start to sort of pick that little nitty gritty piece of the puzzle to start with. So we can't always get done what they ask. And we have to sort of be able to communicate that to them saying in order for you to fix the curvature on your ball flight, you know, we have to get your hands on the golf club in a better position, right? Or pressure, whatever the case may be. You got to be pretty, pretty quick to identify and determine, right? How, how are you going to structure the lesson from here on in? I think it becomes somewhat of a snowball too once you fix one thing then there's uh reactions that happen too afterwards so once it's identified then uh, kind of we move into the next steps too so after diagnosing and, and before we leave diagnosing i don't know if you can see this very well but jeff has a unbelievable assessment tool here and he can he kind of go through and we could email this out anybody that wants this yep. uh, email just shoot us the email and um and actually what we'll do is probably when we produce this video we'll put a put a, a link to uh this pdf uh that yeah, so. looks good it looks real yeah. good yeah it is it's very good so yeah. you know you can you can look at it and it actually would help you teach. It's like a cheat sheet, right? Is oh, this, yeah. this yeah. good, this bad, or whatever. So. Yeah, again, it gives, gives you the option there just to sort of tick the boxes off again so you can remember, you know, how, how that student started, what were your, the situations or conditions were going through all those little, you know, key components mm -hmm. from the type of grip um, to the position, the pressure and ball position, you know, the width of stance, where do you feel their posture is? And there's, there's their shoulders open, closed, hips open, closed. I mean, if you go down through the list, but yeah, um, I like using this sort of thing just to keep me on track with uh, what I've done and where I'm going with that student. So I can um, take the next step as to hopefully they come back for a next lesson and then we can keep reviewing to you know what we've done yeah uh, jeff it, it brings back to what you said about taking a personalized or individual approach to you know how you're starting a documentation like a file folder on them that in turn creates a bit of a commitment on the part of the student to return and develop that file further yeah right yeah totally agree yeah so we, in that list there's the static things at the top and then as you work your way down if you can read that, it says the dynamic observations of the swing. So um, even if you don't have a video component, you know, you can write down your ball flight laws there, initial start, uh, curvature, right? Do they hit the ball more fat versus thin? What's their trajectory? You know, you can kind of look at the swing aspects of takeaway, halfway back, top, transition, impact. You know, some of those things are tough to see with the naked eye, but you know, start to develop a, a good picture of, of what it is that or where you're going and what path you're going to take them down. Yeah. So after diagnosing and kind of identifying what we want to work on, this is where the coaching begins. And, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time. You can see that everything else was kind of five to 10 minutes, whatever it would take before then. When we get into corrections, it'll take multiple lessons. You know, you can't just correct something in a given time frame. But once you've established your focus, um, then you have to figure out where to start, uh, what what item you're going to address, what drill you're going to use to emphasize this new correction or this new feel. 
and how are you going to communicate it to the student? Is the student, you know, a visual learner? Or are they an audible learner? Or, you know, are they going to, are they going to basically get it through the drill? Uh, so that's really important too, is you have to have a game plan to communicate it. Um, is it going to be too much information or too difficult uh, for the student? And also in this kind of correction period, what, what other information can I give them that adds value to the lesson? What, what can I say to them that might, might not be too much information, but is still of value? And then that would come in like a pre-shot routine discussion, ball flight law discussion, uh, shorter, shorter shots, slower motion, you know, show them how to do things in, in a slow motion or, um, by shortening the distance they're hitting or shorter clubs uh, to get the, the different feel. All that becomes, you know, the real meat and potatoes, so to speak, of um, changing somebody's uh, approach. So other, as Mark alluded to, there's those various types of learners, right? Are they, uh, they, they, they learn by watching, listening or doing Right, we find I find that I have a lot of doers. They just like to do, 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 and sometimes they get carried away a little wee bit. So, one of my key things is to keep the golf balls away from them, making sure that they come and get one at a time, and then they have to go through the drill or the exercise that's going to exaggerate, over exaggerate. Uh, what it is doesn't matter whether it's the grip, uh, grip pressure, uh, ball position. They have to really see it, feel it, and do it in exaggerations, so they start to develop a sense for the the correction or the improvement. Those extremes sometimes are the real things that help to resonate with the students. Like, man, that ball position just seems so far back in my stance now because it was so far forward when we started using chalk or paint on the, on the grass or on the turf mats or something to see where the low point is or making goal posts out of the golf tees just to see where the bottom is. And, you know, this would understand, as Mark said, about changing the ball flight and the trajectory as to where the ball is. Little things like that. You know, and that plays a big part when we are around the greens and chipping, right? A ball back in our stance goes different than a ball middle or slightly forward. So that, again, is another way to add value and show them, you know, how important ball position is. But the key uh, word that I've used, I think, in my last um, writing was resonate. What, how do you get something to resonate with that particular student? Because we all don't resonate on the same page on the same day all the time so that becomes the real trick of the trade is to to find something that you can get inside their coconut a little wee bit and get them to remember you know what it is that we're trying to achieve definitely um demonstrating too right there's a power in demonstration so you know if you're if, for instance, if you're trying to hit a chip or a pitch or a pot, it doesn't hurt to, uh, to, to actually execute and show them what you're, you're trying to do. And even though you might not do it to textbook, you're still going to show them, okay, then yeah, I see what you're doing. I can probably emulate that a little bit, right? So once, once you're getting towards the end of the golf lesson, it's always a good idea to have a little challenge for them. Whatever we're working on, I say, okay, I want you to hit two really good ones before we do a review. And I use that over and over again all summer. And, and that's the way I challenge them. I like to see when we put a little pressure on them, uh, are they going to revert back to the beginning of the lesson or are they going to really embrace what we've just worked on for the last 20 minutes and, uh, drilled and and kind of work together in a coaching environment now do they do they kind of maintain that also you don't want to challenge the student to to something that's really really difficult if they're 
a novice, right? So you want it, it, the challenge to be to their level and vice versa. If you're working with somebody that's really good, then you might have a specific uh, challenge. So a challenge, there, there's all kinds of different little things, but it might be if you're doing pitching, you might say, okay, I want you to hit it over this golf club. You lay a golf club down and I want it to stop before it gets to the next golf club. Um, and, you know, it could be relatively close to you and, and just the student got the ball in the air, basically. And that's what we're looking at. Uh, challenge could be if you're hitting full shots, I want it to hit between this marker and this marker. So we're looking to hit the ball a little straighter or we're looking to get a little more distance and want to get it out to the 100 yard marker. Uh, everything's relative to the student at hand. And, and you know what, they'll embrace that. They, you know, golfers tend to be somewhat competitive or they, A, they wouldn't take golf lessons and B, they wouldn't probably play the sport. You know, it's, uh, so when you throw something at them, what does it become? Fun. Right. And that's what the whole golf lesson is, is uh, basically having fun. And, you know, it's it can be fun for both of you. It's, it's especially fun when you you can do something like that. So does everybody remember the difference between blocked and random practice? So the di two different types of practice that we give our students, one is called blocked practice and one is random or randomization. Who, what do we do with blocked practice? What's that all about? I'm assuming that a block is uh, a block of things that you wanna cover and that you've blocked it for to work on a specific skill on that specific day. Random, you're just sort of picking out of the air things for them to do. Is that, am I along you're, the right line? No, you know, you're on the right thing. So Blocked is doing the SOS, the same old stuff, <laughs> right? Same old stuff, Blocked, keeping it simple. Same club, same target, same exercise, same little chip shot over and over and over. So we're getting some repetition to ingrain their brain, right? So it doesn't change. So blocked really works well with, with new golfers, right? Keep it simple. Keep them getting some reps in, going over and over to start to lead to um, build those neural pathways of motor muscle memory, as we call it. Okay. So even blocked works well with, with good students or good players as well. If we're working on a certain piece of their, their swing. Randomization, as you said, was randomizing it. So once they develop that skill from the block practice, then we randomize it by changing the club or changing the target or changing the landing spot or making the hit a little longer or a little shorter just to challenge them to take the skill and challenge them to a new target as it, as it were. So make sure you're using block and randomization, again, specific to the skill set of the student, right? And I, I always go back to saying that slow motion will really help to enhance the learning curve. That's one of the biggest ways to, to get people to sort of stop, see, and feel what it is that they're tr we're trying to get them to achieve in their golf swing. So it has to be specific and has to be deliberate and it has to be slow motion, right? Just like that first cup of coffee in the morning, it's slow pour, right? After the fifth or sixth one, it's the dump, right? You got it, you got it going, right? So. I can't get people to go slow. They find it really challenging. I can't go slow. And I don't know what it is, but maybe it's because I'm getting older. I like slow way better than fast. But anyways, um, don't forget about those two key components to learning. One thing to that, Jeff. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the keys for, for me teaching a lot of beginners 
is to use uh, random practice to help them improve. Uh, so say you're hitting a whole bunch of seven irons off a tee. Uh, what I like to challenge them to do is, okay, you're going to hit your, your next seven iron good, then you're going to put one off the grass. So it becomes one off the tee, one off the grass, one off the tee. And all of a sudden, the ones off the tee become effortless. It's like, holy, this is, this is like cheating now, Mark. And it's like, yeah, because, because it is easier. And, and all of a sudden, they start to learn, right? So yeah. they don't learn from just hitting seven irons off the tee over and over and over. They yeah. do at the very, the very beginning. Uh, however, you know, as, as time progresses, that little randomization um, really helps. Yeah. So yeah, I, I like think that. a lot of beginners, they spend so much time on the range that randomization helps emulate an experience that they're going to have on the course. So you're setting them up for success when they actually do get out. Yeah, come over here. Play for sure. Right. And explaining that to the student that, hey, look, at you, you want to hit your driver. You're going to hit it maximum 12 to 12 times would be even probably a stretch for most golf courses. Uh, so if you hit it 20 times in a row, what are you really learning here on the range? First thing you're learning is the opposite of what Jeff was talking about is going slow motion because after driver number six, they're only thinking about distance. They're not thinking about technique anymore. Um, and, and they'll even tell you that they'll say, Oh, I hit that one. All right. It didn't go anywhere. So that's the mindset. Right. And, and so you can't, you know, you can do what you want, but successful instruction is not allowing somebody to hit driver, 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 you know, uh, get some yeah. wedges in there, right? Randomize it. <clears throat> yeah, especially if we're, you know, if, if we get to that point where they're, we all know that the slice is probably the number one thing that people come to us for, right? So we have to work on re-educating the, the path of the club head down through um, the ball. So, you know, using things on the ground, give them some visual stimulation um, by using uh, all sorts of things from head covers to training aids, that sort of thing, just so they really start to get a mental image of what's supposed to happen <laughs> down there when said club head's supposed to meet the ball. Right, paint them a picture, show them pictures, um, you know, over exaggerate. Really, really get in them to start to thinking about, you know, what has to happen. And then they'll start to ad adapt and adopt uh, how they need to get that club head to, to travel in that direction. So they can start to self discover and figure things out on their own. So Lead, give them some time, right? Challenge them and let them go to work. Don't have to stand over them um, like a primary school teacher with a with a pointer and whacking them on the back. Just let them let them go to work. Kids, same thing. I just had two great little kids on the weekend, and I just give them a task. I put some alignment rods down and let them go to it. They start to figure it out. So after the challenge is complete, uh, it's time to review. Um, really, really important that you are clear on your points of em emphasis. Uh, this is the point where you're gonna prescribe your homework. Um, you're gonna discuss what they're gonna do before you, you see them again. Practice plan, uh, routine. So some of your students might play a lot. So you're gonna discuss what they should expect on the golf course. Um, what, what, what's gonna be working, what's not gonna be working, uh, how you keep them from reverting to what they've always done. Um, and you know, make sure that they understand what their old habits look like and the new feel um, that we're trying to achieve it is in there and, and what it feels like. Uh, Jeff's already said that we're going to train their brain to ingrain. Um, reassure them that it takes time and it's 
and it requires patience. And, and then also um, establishing ways to measure uh, and determine improvements because scores not only, uh, one hole could ruin a game, right? So a score is not going to be that metric that, uh, is, well, I shot 97 the other day and I, before the lesson, I had a, a 97. So, but meanwhile, you know, I had 112. So like you, you can't go just by the score, right? Um, so you, you got to come up with kind of a plan with your student. You have to remember you're the, you're the coach as well as the instructor, right? Like you're in their corner and they need to need to feel like you're in their corner. Um, you'd be surprised, but the more you teach, the more emails you get uh, from happy golfers. I said, oh, you know, I've never hit the ball like this. I was playing with my brother. I play with him all the time. And, and he's like, holy smokes, this is like night and day. So that's what coaching is all about, right? Yeah, I, I changed my barometer for success for those students that are especially younger groups um, and starting out like golfing in the field for the first time. And I'll say score yourself with a happy face or a neutral face or a sad face on each hole. And that's all determined by how they're striking the ball or how many times they hit it well, or maybe they hit a great putt from 30 feet and that's a happy hole and then your goal now is to get more happy faces on your scorecard in nine or 18 holes that's great yeah um i think what adam just pointed out there about the happy face or a sad face is really key uh, because if golf isn't fun you might as well get another sport right yes yeah. so i think uh, i work a lot with special olympics athletes and so for one thing, they're always happy. That's never a problem. And they always forget any kind of bad shots they make. So that's also a plus. But I find that the score is not what's important to them. And more of us who, some of us, we like to score well for sure. But the more we took our emphasis off that and put it onto playing the game well, enjoying the flight of the ball as it goes, uh, the feeling in the swing, I think the better we become. Agree a hundred percent. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Another way I, I teach them the, uh, is uh, my beginner ladies, they, they do worry about score and they want to score. And so I say, if you want to score, we're going to sit down and you're going to create your own scorecard because you're a beginner and chances are, if it's a par three, you're going to end up with a higher score than that. So I want you to realistically think how many shots is it going to take you to put it down in the hole? So maybe your own personal par is six. Maybe your own personal par on a five is a 10. And then slowly we can work it back to an eight, to a seven, to a six, to a five, and you'll be making your pars. But for now, create your own pars, create your own, um, your own scores. The other thing for my juniors is I say to them, if you hit one bad shot, you're allowed one free throw <laughs> per hole. So they can they can um, haul off and hit the ball one free hole uh, away and uh, geez they have they have fun to just throw it and you should see them giggle and laugh about that. It's a different way of approaching, but I think it has been successful for me. Just a thought. I read a uh, post tonight on one of these Facebook groups um, of golfers and and. Uh, the guy basically says, I'm a bogey golfer and I hit decent shots, but I just make bogeys. And he says, would I have more fun if I spent a whole bunch of time and got better or is bogey golf good enough? And he says, because I'm not having fun making bogeys. And so I, I got thinking about that a little bit and it all depends on the person, um, you know, what, what you want out of the game, but, yeah. and, and it changes. So after the lesson, so the lesson's now complete, you did your review, um, you've given them their homework, you've had fun, um, you're going to evaluate, and this is how you get better as an instructor. Uh, did the student have fun? Um, was the lesson a success? Did they, did they realize what you're trying to, uh, to change? 
Are they going to be able to do it? Are they on the right path? Do they need anything as follow-up? Do you, did you promise to send them anything or are you going to send them a, a review? That's one of the things that, you know, might separate you from the other person teaching golf lessons. Do you need to uh, put their next time in the calendar? This is one of the things that I'm not great at. I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see you same time next week and then show up next week and I've got two people at the same time. It's like, Mark. And what, what really worked for your student that you might want to put in the memory bank is, as Jeff calls it, a keeper. What, what keeper do you want to use for other students? You know, that really helped with that student. And all of a sudden, it might help with uh, future students. So that's how we get better is a little analysis of, of our own performance. And, you know, I think that's anything in life is uh, you can't just look at the players. You got to look at the coaching, too. And this is your chance to now to start to plan for the next lesson. Maybe you want to say that to them. You know, if, it, if you haven't already upsold them for a package of lessons, say, you know, go and work on this, you know, come back in 10, 14 days and we will work on this. We'll check how you're doing and we'll be able to proceed or to progress, take your game to the next level, right? So you're already thinking ahead and letting them know that, again, you, you're on the path with them on their journey to, to better golf, right? So last week I took um, a virtual sales training um, course that was put on by Chamber of Commerce, actually out of Peterborough. Anybody knows where Peterborough is, it's about an hour away from me. But anyways, the very first question the guy said is, it's four days. I've got uh, another one on Wednesday and the next two Wednesdays. But he, the first question the, um, the presenter says, or facilitator says, what's, what's everybody's impression of sales? And there was a young guy and he's probably, I don't know, 20 years old. And he said, well, he says, a lot of people think of it as a negative. He says, I, I think it's just offering people uh, help you know, I, I'm trying to help them with something and I don't see sales as a negative at all. And of course, that's exactly what the uh, facilitator wanted to establish, right? Is that when, when Jeff says upsell, basically you want to continue to help somebody, right? Like that isn't a negative at all. You're, you're just creating an expedited journey of the golf game, right? Or the, you know, the golf experience. You, you're yeah. trying to to take something and make it a shorter journey. journey. I, I had a student tell me this summer, his parents are really good people and he's a good guy, just a little few difficulties. But he said to me, he says, Mark, if I really wanted to learn how to golf, I'd come here on Friday and I would, I would hit balls all day and I'd have it all figured out. And I said, you know, you're partly right. You would never figure out golf by spending all day uh, on your own with no guidance. Uh, but it would be better for me if you'd try that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So don't, don't think a sale is a negative. That's for sure. How are we doing, Jeff? Good. Good. I think I think we're doing well. Um, yeah, I think that post lesson thing is is a quick moment for you to review to how you did um, and what you felt were your strengths and your weaknesses and how you can you can get better and how you're going to proceed for them. Start to challenge yourself to to plan and prepare for their their next session. And again, I would be making some little bit of uh, notes um, on some paper um, just so that again you have your plan is and your plan is going according to their short-term goals or long-term goals and have that discussion open with them freely is to say well in order to get to to the end of the journey we have to go here here and here first and we have to achieve these little you know short-term goals before we can get there so you know, you're going to have to find more time to practice. You're going to have to play a lot more. 
are you willing to do that? Do you have the, the availability, the lifestyle, you know, from family, uh, work situations, right? So be, be honest, be open, be realistic with them. You, you're there to help them and you'll do anything and everything you can, but they have to be an equal participant because we all know that people start off with good intentions and yet um, when they come back for that second or third lesson and you ask them, how did practice go? And you know what the answer is going to be. Uh, geez, my car broke down, you know, had to take the dog to the vet and had to take my wife, you know, on a vacation or whatever. There's no time to practice or play. So, and, and those are all just life things that kind of get in the way. So we have to be able to roll with the punches and regroup and get them back on track. Um, has everybody heard of a program called Operation 36? Uh, one of our other pros here at Hidden Lake beat me to this program, but this is a really neat little program. Um, you should check it out if you're into teaching beginner golfers and it has a, a tracking process on a golf app, um, comes with a little scorecard. These people get a little bit of instruction and then they go out and then they start from as close as 25 yards from the hole. And as they progress, they work back further and further and they're able to track their scores uh, both online and on the back of the scorecard. Uh, but a pretty, very unique pros, process and program. I wish I would have gotten there before the other guy. But um, anyways, if check it out. It's kind of a neat thing. And it'll uh, certainly get your, your new golfers out there from all ages and abilities and keeps it fun. Right, lots yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Just a, it's called Operation 36. You see that on my camera? Yep. yep. Jeff, does 36 refer to uh, even par for nine hole or something? Yes. Yes, it does, Adam. It's an American based company, let me tell you that. And there are royalties to it. So it's not a freebie by any means, but. Um, I, I've seen it take off here at Hidden Lake. Uh, geez, the gals and some juniors were out even last week. We had a couple of nice days here, but they're, they, they block off a tea time for them to go out and they walk out and there's cones set out at the various distances. So all the short golfers start up front and then the next one's behind and then off they go. And it's just like, uh, a whole field of minions out there <laughs> roaming around till it's dark. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, we uh, you got we got a few minutes. We can take a couple questions, but we're seven fifty nine. So uh -huh. yeah, budgeted time well, just like in a lesson. Hey, eh? just uh, paid attention to the clock. Uh, uh, don't go over too much. Any questions yeah. out there? <laughs> I have a question, but it doesn't concern it. Uh, first of all, your presentation was excellent. Took many, many notes and I'll, I'll start to do things a little bit different, but I want to know where Dawn, Dawn is located at because I teach a special little program here in uh, BC. I have uh, eight athletes. I started the program from scratch. I'd like to know where he's located. Victoria. I'm yeah. just un unmuting myself. I'm in Australia. Yeah, you sound like it too. It, the weather, I hate to tell you this, buddy, but the weather doesn't look like Australia. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, I'm in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Okay, good. I'm in Chilliwack, British Columbia. How about that? Okay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try and get your email and stuff uh, or from uh, Mark. Thank you. Or right, I'll put it in the chat for you right now if you want. Okay, how do I get to that? Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, yeah, that'd be great if you would. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Sorry to take up time. Oh, it's all good. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Nothing better than networking yeah. in these as well, right? It's uh, uh, the world's getting smaller all the time. So even though Canada's big, 
So I had a, one of my students participated in the uh, Ontario Disabilities Championship here in Toronto. And then we had the um, Canadian All Abilities Championship again here in Toronto. And uh, as Don said, you never see so many smiling faces in your life playing golf. There's, there's no bad shots. They're always smiling, always happy. Um, it's contagious. It's, it's a whole lot of fun to be with those, uh, with those athletes. You happen to know where the next one will be? I don't. I don't offhand. I have a couple of my more high performance uh, athletes in the Special Olympics here in Victoria who would be well suited to go into that. Yeah, we had, I was, um, I know there was one gentleman in the all abilities from, from BC. He was, um, he was from Ireland originally. He wasn't a youngster by any means, um, but, but quite an accomplished player. I don't recall his name, but uh, there's, there's some pretty amazing golfers out there. Mm -hmm. My athletes aren't at a very high level yet. Uh, we only play, we only practice an hour, an hour a week. However, I've seen major improvement in them this year. We've been practicing one, one week in a range. The next week we go out and play. And I'm hoping soon that uh, one or two of them will be able to play. And a couple of them got legitimate pars this year. You should have seen their faces okay. when they did what awesome. they were doing. They were just thrilled. Never, never, ever do I see them in a bad mood, though. They're so excited to be there. Yeah. It's good learning. It's good experience and good learning for us to learn. Huh. You know, <clears throat> it's a game. Totally Keep it agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, if there's no further questions, we'll, uh, we'll thank you all for coming and taking your time and uh, supporting us as well. Uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll edit the video out a little bit and uh, and then post it uh, on YouTube and probably circulate it in the next uh, next month's email. Um, and we'll get that uh, um, checklist off of Jeff and we'll get it publicized as well. Perfect. So, yeah. Perfect. Oh. No, yeah, I just want to close out by saying, just make sure that you have a purpose. You have a purpose so that they have a purpose, right? There's a goal. There's always a goal uh, for that lesson, for that learning experience, right? What do you want them to achieve? What do they have to achieve during that session, right? Or work towards. So keep it simple. <clears throat> have lots of fun. Keep it real. <clears throat> do you guys go by do you guys go uh hour blocks all yes, the time i do it's always an hour always for me just it's just half hours too short i think so by the time you do all that stuff and you know if you start to incorporate video then it starts to really get tight Stuart, you know? also depends on your clientele like if you're teaching kids the attention yeah. span is tough if you're teaching really older people, they physically can't hit balls for an hour. So they need breaks and that sort of thing. So sometimes I'll throw a half hour lesson at a, you know, a 75 year old or something yeah. like that. So, you know, you, you start to learn that the more you teach the, the, what, what you're going to uh, figure out. I think the uh, breakdown that you guys provided as far as five minutes reserved for the introduction and 15 minutes towards you know, the cool down at the end, you, you tend to end up with that really half hour meat and potatoes as part of your lesson plan anyway, as outlined in the slides. So that, yeah, that's your pivotal sort of point where you're trying to get whatever you're trying to get across. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to call her a night and uh, thanks everybody. Thanks Jeff for all the hard work putting us oh. together again. Thank thanks, you Mark, for all yours. Thank Pleasure. You. It's great to see everybody. Nice to everybody. Continue to stay safe. And... I'll delay to come in. That's that's great. All right. Maybe we'll see you next month. Yep. Take care. Thank Night. you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Bye. Cheers. Nice to see everybody. Welcome, yep. Valerie.